So he had actually called me, his mom, his dad, his brother, and um, you know, he had even hugged his little girls and her teddy bear before he left to give it a kiss because he had a bad feeling. On the day of his accident, it was a summer day. A boom truck got tangled in the guide wires. I think they were trying to leave the site, you know, after finishing up that day. It was a real hot day. And from my understanding, they didn't get out and check their surroundings and they go to leave and snap the guide wire. And when they snapped the guide wire, the tower itself fell. Yes and your husband and Bridget's husband were on the tower. That is correct. My name is Allison Sloan. Um, my husband was Barry Marshall Sloan. Um, he was a tower climber for McCord Communications. He had been climbing towers for approximately 10 years um, when he was killed on July 22nd, um, 2010. At that time, he was 37 years old. I'm Bridget Hester and I was married to John Hubble, who was a telecommunications technician. He climbed off and on for years before we met, and then after we were together for a while, and right before we got married, he went back to climbing. So collectively, I guess, probably 10 or more years over the course of his life climbing. I was at work. Um... I work for Child Protective Services. When I got a call from Bridget Hubble Hester, um, whose husband was actually on the tower with Barry at the time of the accident. We all waited in a room. I think it was me, BJ, his brother Jason, BJ's husband, and his dad. And we waited in one of those little rooms, you know. He was missing an arm and a leg, totally unconscious, and they were fixing they were just about to take him up for abdominal surgery, but they wanted me to see him first if I wanted to see him. He had told me like this Saturday before when we were on the boat um, that he had a bad feeling about this particular tower. Like he didn't go into details, but he just said, you know, I just have a bad feeling that, you know, something bad is going to happen. And then when I was on my way home, um, you know, trying to get home to find out what was going on, um, and I got the call that the police were at my house, you know, then I was kind of like, oh, something's not good, it's not right. And they wouldn't tell me anything, of course. So I didn't know that Barry had um, been killed until I actually got home, and that's when they confirmed it. He wasn't gonna get better. If they were pumping it in just as fast as it was getting pumped out, and the decision was made you know, to just stop because it, he wouldn't want to live like that. They didn't see him, foresee him recovering. I remember walking out the front door, down to the street, sitting on like the garden, whatever wall divider thing that's right there. And I remember calling my dad and he was at church because he was pastor for a biker church. And later he told me, I was so loud when I screamed that the entire church heard me through his phone.
why did he feel like he could drink that day? I don't know. And the fact that they were all drinking that day, um, it's crazy. My name is Tria Combs. My husband was Jeremy Combs. He died on September 12th, 2008. He was 33 years old. We were high school sweethearts. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I love and, that. You were high school yeah. sweethearts. And he like did distribution warehouse job and then he sold it like worked for sleep country and did mattresses just kind of struggled to find his niche and then um got into the tower um tower climbing business and man he just he just soared he was so proud the week prior he was out of town um i don't remember where uh and working a lot of hours. Um, I think it was like the 3G boom um, at that time. And I checked in with him and I could tell that he'd been drinking mm -hmm. and I thought that was weird. And I'm like, I asked him, and I was like, are you drinking? And he didn't really answer me. Hours later, right around midnight, I got a phone call that he had fallen. I was super scared. They told me that he um, had fallen and I think they said that he was unconscious, but that he, they thought he broke his arm and that wasn't very far of a fall. Um, and that I believe they said he had squeezed someone's hand. I was waiting for my mom to come and then I got a phone call from the doctor who told me that um, he didn't think, I mean, I think he asked me for my, mom, my mom's phone number at one point, asked me if I was alone. Um, and they also told me my husband had lost a lot of blood. There was a lot of holes. Basically had broken all of his, um, most of all, I think all of his ribs. And when my mom and my little brother arrived, um, my brother walked in first and I just could see on my brother's face. Like they, they knew and they told me. So that's, that's when I knew that my husband had passed away. They just, the doctor didn't obviously want me to be alone. He had fallen from this crazy rooftop um, elevator shaft and hit another piece of building on his way down. They said the antennas were on above them. So, and the gentle, some of the gentlemen working had RF poisoning system, symptoms reported. So I don't really know if that was a factor. I just, I felt like, you know, we'll never really maybe know what went on that night. Um, I just don't think people really comprehend how serious it is and how risky this job is. You know, it's the company, you know, they're responsible for their people in the field. The companies have to be held accountable. The turf vendors have to be held accountable. The carriers have to be held accountable. Don't even get me into the whole subcontracting paradigm of this industry. That site that they were on that night was in the paperwork. It said that it was a job that should have been done in 12 hours, but it really was bid for five. But they were like, oh, well, we'll find somebody else to do it if you won't. So... There's a middleman. I don't really think there should be a middleman because the middleman insulates for the big guys, for the, the Verizons, the AT&Ts. And that's where, when you have the middleman, you don't get to hold the big guys liable. So I have a real problem with that.
the push, 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 push constantly right. pushing. And then, like you said, like, who's really accountable for this? And what happens to families when the sole provider is now injured or gone? It, like, you know, the, something has to change. Like something has to change now. You know, there wasn't a humble foundation. There wasn't somebody to, you know, it was my lawyer or it was my my girlfriends or my dad or my neighbors or whatever, but there was no entity to help. This is clearly as I'm speaking to you, I heard, not audibly, but you know how you feel yes. something in your spirit and hear it. And it was like, my child, I told you what you're going to do. So you just need to get on. I was like, yes. And here we go. Here we go. More I learned a lot of women are stay at home moms and housewives and they don't have any means if something were to happen, which is why I harp on them to get insurance. You said that you feel like education is important and also advocacy. So making the masses, society understand what it takes for these men and women to do this job, why it's dangerous and to advocate for them to have better safety regulations, more training. Um, you do feel that advocacy is, is, a, is a big part that needs to be present within the community. Absolutely, because aside from um, the Hubble Foundation and then you, I've not heard of any advocacy. No I mean, one has nothing. No one, mm -mm, nothing. You know, we have, I can look around and see powers everywhere. Somebody has to work on them. Somebody has to make sure those lights on the top are working and make sure they're painted, you know, make sure that, you know, whatever's going, whatever signals they need or whatnot. Somebody's climbing those towers. And it's sad that, you know, I've only heard of two people that are doing stuff for this. I'm really sad. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, for sharing your story with us because I think for people to really understand, they need to see the, the faces of individuals who've been directly affected and you have been directly affected by the lack of training, the lack of advocacy, the lack of regulations within the industry. So thank yes. you for speaking up and being willing to share your story with us. I just saw on a page, one of the climber pages and they were like, we do it for the babies, you know? They do it for their babies, their wives and their babies, you know, they, they have to do it to provide. Mm -hmm. And they love what they do. Right. Okay, well, you love what you do and you're good at it, but so just, I mean, but no, it, make it better. Do better make by them. Better. Make it better. And I think that that's like really, like that sort of ties it up. Make it better. That's it. Make it better. Make it better. Um, what do you think climbing meant to him? Like, did he enjoy it a lot? Was it something? Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, he had hopes of one day actually owning his own company um, because he enjoyed it that much. He always said, like, the higher he climbed, the closer to God he felt. So. Mm. Mm. I mean, how do I do deal with it? I mean, I have faith. And I know that God numbers our days. And I believe that as far as my husband goes too, you know, it was his time. Mm. So it's really hard for me to accept that, but I do, I do believe that.
If you could describe him in three words, what would they be? Hero. Friend. Mm. Friend to all. And provider. Funny, ambitious, um, a daredevil. Gregarious, meticulous, meticulous, which is not just in appearance, but in everything. Um, and loyal. Mm. They're good. Th they're three good ones. Oh, yeah. Really good ones. <laughs>